everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about the different kinds of cranial hemorrhages and hematomas. We will learn this topic by solving questions so that we understand this better. If you're interested in medical videos, quizzes, need some guidance to pursue residency, and many other things related to medicine, do subscribe to my channel. You can also find me on Instagram. Let's first take a look at the anatomy so that pathologies become much easier. A human head has many layers from the skin to the brain. Right below the skin is the subcutaneous layer. Below that, we have fibrous tissues called the epicranial aponeurosis. Epi means on top and sub means below. So, epicranial aponeurosis is on top of the cranium. Like other bones, the outer part of the cranium is the periosteum. The dura, arachnoid and pia are the three layers of the meninges. Finally, this purple structure is our brain. Question number one. A transient loss of consciousness in an 18-year-old male after a head trauma is likely due to which of the following hematomas? Option A, epidural. Option B, subdural. Option C, subarachnoid. Option D, intraparenchymal. The answer to this question is epidural hematoma. Since epi means on top, epidural hematoma is on top of the dura and below the cranium. The hematoma is confined to one position, so it cannot cross the suture lines. However, it can push the dura that's below it and expand in this direction. Head trauma is the most common cause of this condition. The terion is the weakest part of the lateral skull. So, when the side of a person's head is injured, this area is highly likely to be affected. The middle meningeal artery is present in this place. So, when there is an intense force to this area, the middle meningeal artery ruptures and gives rise to epidural hematomas. A characteristic feature of epidural hematoma is a brief loss of consciousness followed by a lucid interval. This means, typically, a patient would first get injured and lose consciousness for a while. Then, he will gain consciousness and feel completely alright like nothing ever happened. This conscious phase is known as the lucid interval. Once the hematoma begins expanding, the patient's condition will begin to deteriorate and he would lose consciousness once again. This is also known as talk and die syndrome. Note that this transient loss of consciousness is not necessary for a patient to be diagnosed with epidural hematoma. A head CT is the best way to diagnose it. Since this hematoma can expand quickly, it can compress the brain tissue and can lead to herniation and CN3 palsy. Can you recall what kind of CN3 symptoms an epidural hematoma would cause? If you have forgotten or want to learn about it, check this video out. Question number 2. Confusion, amnesia and lethargy in an old person weeks after a mild head trauma is likely due to Option A. Post-concussive syndrome Option B. Chronic subdural hematoma The answer to this question is post-concussive syndrome. A concussion is basically a mild traumatic brain injury. Patients would have symptoms of headache, amnesia, and might even lose consciousness. What makes this different from other traumatic brain injuries is that there is no abnormality seen on a head CT. Days to weeks after a concussion, patients might experience lethargy, dizziness, headache, amnesia, etc. They might also complain of difficulty concentrating and multitasking. This is known as post-concussive syndrome. Chronic subdural hematoma is also a possibility in older people with mild head trauma. However, a chronic subdural hematoma will also have symptoms of focal neurological deficits like hemiparesis or aphasia due to the effect of hematoma on the brain tissues. As the name suggests, subdural hematomas occur below the dura. Acute subdural hematomas are caused due to highly intense trauma, while mild trauma can cause chronic subdural hematoma. Patients with cerebral atrophy are at a higher risk. 
This is because a small brain will be able to move easily within the skull and can increase the chances of blood vessel disruption. When seen in babies, be very careful as it could be a sign of abuse. This is called shaken baby syndrome. Subdural hematomas occur due to an injury to the bridging veins. This hematoma can cross the suture lines. Question number 3. Which of the following drugs should be given to a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage? Option A. Epinephrine Option B. Nemodipine Option C. Verapamil The answer to this question is nemodipine. Subarachnoid hemorrhage is below the arachnoid and above the pia. Common causes are trauma, rupture to a berry aneurysm, and AV malformation. A unique feature, apart from the classical worst headache of my life, is that subarachnoid hemorrhage can be diagnosed by a lumbar puncture. A lumbar puncture is done in patients when the clinical suspicion of subarachnoid hemorrhage is high, although the head CT is negative. A lumbar puncture would show a yellow fluid. This fluid gets a yellow color due to the breakdown of red blood cells in the subarachnoid space. Complications of subarachnoid hemorrhage includes rebleeding and vasospasm. Rebleed usually occurs within the first day, while vasospasm occurs between day 3 and day 7 after the event. Vasospasm can be prevented by giving calcium channel blockers. Nemodipine is usually the drug of choice. I remember this because N for nemodipine and N for neuro. Although verapamil is a calcium channel blocker, it works majorly in the heart and not as much in the blood vessels of the brain. Also, V for ventricles and V for verapamil. Question number 4. What is the most likely cause of intraparenchymal hemorrhage in a 75-year-old male who doesn't have a history of hypertension and diabetes? Option A, Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysm. Option B, protein deposition. Option C, none of the above. The answer to this question is protein deposition. This patient is likely to have amyloid angiopathy. Amyloid is a protein that gets deposited in the blood vessels of the brain. Patients with this condition will have recurrent hemorrhages within the brain parenchyma. Although hypertension is the most common cause of brain hemorrhage, the lack of hypertension and diabetes in our patient points towards something else. So, we can rule Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysms out. Amyloid angiopathy is commonly seen in older patients. Another difference between these two conditions is the location. The hemorrhage due to hypertension mainly occurs in the basal ganglia. The one that occurs due to amyloid angiopathy mainly involves the parietal and occipital lobes. Question number 5. A newborn has a bulge in his head which you notice 36 hours after delivery. The scalp swelling is firm and doesn't cross the suture lines. What is the most likely diagnosis? Option A. Subgaleal hemorrhage. Option B. Cephalohematoma. The answer to this question is cephalohematoma. These two conditions can be caused by vacuum-assisted vaginal delivery and forceps delivery. Subgaleal hemorrhage occurs between the aponeurosis and the periosteum. It is free to move and can cross the suture lines. It presents late and the neonate may have symptoms of tachycardia and pallor. Cephalohematoma is present between the periosteum and the bone. This cannot cross the suture lines. If the hematoma breaks down, patients might have high indirect bilirubin and might require phototherapy. Question number 6. What is the possible cause of brain hemorrhage in a premature infant? Brain hemorrhage in premature or low birth weight infants is due to low glial fiber support. The hemorrhage takes place within the ventricles of the brain. The germinal matrix has a lot of blood vessels and can hence lead to interventricular bleeding. The low glial fiber support, along with impaired regulation of blood pressure in their brain, predisposes them to this condition. To sum it up, we learned the different layers from the skin to the brain. We spoke about subdural, epidural, subarachnoid, and intraparenchymal hemorrhages. I also learned about subgaleal hemorrhage and cephalohematoma. 
we also spoke about concussion and interventricular hemorrhage. If you want me to make more videos like this, please give this video a thumbs up, share it with a friend and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.